Welcome to Secret Church. Most of you know what we're doing tonight and uh, what we've been doing over these last few weeks is we've been studying um, cult and counterfeit gospels. And uh, tonight, if you have your notes, you want to go and turn with me, first of all, to page 85, where we were last week. We're going to review just a little bit. But, and while you're getting to 85 a little bit, I want us to look at the screens as well. We looked at first at the one true gospel, and then after the one true gospel, we looked at the one true God. So you have to know the real thing before you can really identify the wrong thing or the thing that's a, a false or a counterfeit gospel. And the one true God is revealed in three persons. God is three persons um, revealed in one. Each person is fully God, and there is one God. This is a very, very distinct part of understanding who our God is. But then we looked into what is a cult and what is a counterfeit gospel. Um, back up one. What is a cult? Uh, back up just a little bit. There we go. Can anybody kind of define a cult for me based upon our lesson? Do you, do, can anybody just say it off the top of your head? What's a cult? Okay, so one of the characteristics is there's what? One, usually with a cult, there is a key personality that is either the, the founder of it or the continuing leader of it, so, or both. So we see that it's driven typically, if it's a cult, it's dri typically driven around a personality, right? So that's an important thing. To go, go to the next slide there. So these are groups that claim to be harmony with Christianity but deny foundational Christian doctrines. And then the next slide shows that they are typically around one individual who dictates the false teaching. But there's also something that we are studying called counterfeit gospels. Because anybody tell me, what do we mean by a counterfeit gospel? Don't, don't go there yet, but um, he's going to give you the answer. Don't give him the answer, Ronnie. Um, okay, so who wants to take a couple of shots? Let's take a couple of shots at what is a counterfeit gospel? Sissy? Okay, so when we start going away from what the scripture says, when we start going to things that are antithetical or not in line with scripture, that, that would be good. And did you hear another thing that she added there? What, well, what, what else did she say? When we're adding to the gospel. So we may say, yes, indeed, Jesus is the savior of the world and, you know, something else, and Mary or and the Pope or and the councils or and... Joseph Smith, or and something else. Or as we see, as we study the Catholic Church, um, one of the key things where they would say, oh yes, you are definitely justified before God by faith in Jesus Christ and works. That's what they add to that, and your works. So that is why this is so very dangerous, because when we start to go and add something to what God has said, there is no way you can add to what I've done, then we start gravitating to trust in something besides Christ alone. And this is what the Reformation was all about. Can anybody help me out with the five solas? The five onlys. The word sola means only. What are the five solas of the Reformation? Can anybody give me the first one? I heard somebody say it, but here. The first one is, we say Scripture is the sole authority. And then there's about three things that go together here. It is faith alone, in grace alone, in Christ alone. So it's God's grace through faith in, excuse me, God's, yes, it's God's grace through faith in Christ. That is the, those are, those are the only things that we have. So we put our faith in the grace of God through Christ. We can't get God's grace through anything other than Jesus Christ. Not through our works can we get grace. It's only by God's gift in Jesus Christ. So it's the scripture alone that we say grace through faith in Christ and all for what? The glory of God alone, as opposed to what? The glory of man. 
Very good. You guys are doing great. So if, if uh, you kind of don't know what these five solas are, you say, where in the world did that come from? I, we would just say to you, wait till October because our church celebrates the Reformation. We spend about five or six weeks on the Reformation, enjoying the history of the Reformation. We're going to do that again this coming October. And so um, it's, a, it's a rich time of seeing what God has done through the church and through Christian history as, as many of these false gospels started taking over. And then by God's grace, there were, there were men and women who had great convictions that God's word is what we need, and they went back to the message of the Bible, not the message of a corrupt church. So these are important things that we've been looking at. Now, there is one more thing under a counterfeit gospel that we're looking at, and here's the idea, is that we take, go ahead and go to the next one there. It's a fraudulent imitation of the gospel, and it's a fraudulent imitation that deceives. So it looks like the gospel, it sounds like the gospel, but there's other things that have either been taken out or added to it, and it deceives people away from Christ. It deceives people, it gets the focus off of Christ, and ultimately it focuses back on something in creation as opposed to the creator. So God has made us to worship the creator, and we are not to worship anything that is, that is made. We are only to worship the one who makes um, all things. And so this is an important part of where we've been. Now, without going on to the next one, what are some of the things that we've studied so far? What are some of the cults that we've studied? Help me out. Okay, Mormonism, that's very good. What else did we study? Which other one? Jehovah's Witnesses. We looked at both of those. Um, what else? We spent time in Catholicism. And so the one that we're looking at right now is um, Prosperity Gospel. And uh, so I have a little quiz for you tonight um, as, we, as we go forward. And I'm going to see how much some of you watch television, I guess, a little bit. But let's go on. We've studied the book of Jude in the life of our church. And as we studied Jude, we recognize that this is, Jude is kind of written saying, hey, all of those false teachers that Jesus warned us were coming, they're here. That's what it says in Jude. They're here, and they were there in the first century, just within, within a few decades of Jesus. We see the gospel go out powerfully, but we also see false gospels rise up. And we also see false men and women rising up in the church, seeking to take the spotlight off of Christ and put it upon themselves and deceiving people away from the gospel into various controversies and into various loves of things in the world. This is, this is always antithetical to what God has created. So we said this is Jude was all about describing apostate deceivers, these deceivers. You remember we said just now, counterfeit gospel seeks to deceive and that's what these guys do and they do it for their own gain what are some of their uh, what are what are some of the areas of gain that they that they do their deceiving for why power somebody said what it was the other one money what else prestige okay yeah that's kind of like power but what else control seeking to control that's right i heard ivan say another one sex and you say, well, we're not supposed to say that. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Look at Christian history. Look at Christian history. People that rise up in the name of Jesus before God's people and are using their influence over people to satisfy their own flesh, to gratify their own flesh, immorally, wrongly, not saying, I'm going to go after the prettiest woman in the church and marry her and make her my wife. No, some of these guys, I'm going to go after all the women in the church and make them, I mean, very, very corrupt in this. So these deceivers typically have something that they're really getting out of the whole thing, whether it be power, pride, position, fame, fame um, whatever it is, the issue of conquering, whatever, and then even sexuality. So we, when we use that graphic, um, go on to the next one here, we, we said that the graphic was made up of a bunch of pictures, and um, these are some of the faces that you maybe have seen on television in a, you know, you got the flu and everything, you can't go to work, you turn on the television, oh, you know, this, and so let's go on, let's look at another one here. How about those other two couples that are out there? Um, you know, the, what we used to call the hair people, so um, they always have fantastic hair. Um, take a look at these eight pictures, and so here's our little game, you're not allowed to blurt anything out, 
not allowed to blurt, blurt anything out, but here's our game. Go on to the next one here. Name that prosperity preacher. How many of you can name this prosperity preacher? Okay, first, and if you can't name any of these, you may win the, win the award, okay? So that, that's actually a good thing that you can't, but okay, so the first one, if you know who that is, would you please just lift your hand if you know who that guy is? Bernita, is it just me and you? Oh, oh no, there's a few more, a few more. Okay, you kind of know who this guy is. By the way, this is one of the original prosperity preachers, or one of the early ones that became very popular. Hint number two, can I say Tulsa, Oklahoma? Does that help a little bit? He started a university. Oh, Oral Roberts. Okay, so only three of you got that one. That's good. So most of you are doing really well. Miss Faye, you and Bernita are in trouble. And so you don't remember? That's right. Okay, you didn't recognize. Yeah, he did get old. Yeah. In fact, he is the one who said, he is the one who said, if, if you don't give $8 million in the next three weeks, I'm going to die. Do you remember that? Well, he died eventually, but, but he, you didn't give, so he died, Jim, <laughs> Tim. Good, that's good. So, but anyways, all about miracles, all about sow your blessings, all about your destiny, all about God wants you to be wealthy, God wants you to be happy, all of these things of saying, you know, you, if you do this, these are, who is the next? If you know who the next one is, would you please raise your hand? Oh, wow, the crowd has gone up, okay. Um, so who is the next guy? What's his name? Benny Hinn. Um, very long, sordid story, um, in this, in this guy, um, some of the most dramatic ones that, that are there. Um, moved to Orlando, has his Rolls Royces and all of the things and his jets. And um, He is the one that when I was in Algeria and I took a bunch of guys to Malta to make the evangelistic film, do you remember I told the story that I came up from dinner one night and all the guys had been sitting around that evening and they had it all planned out. I walked in, they said, Andrew, Andrew, what is this? And he went, and they all fell down in the cloud, in the crowd. And they said, we, we don't, they had been watching Benny Hinn by satellite. And um, it was, you know, these, these ridiculous things. So um, the next one, um, does anybody, how many of you know who the next guy is? Okay. He right now is raising $54 million for his new aircraft um, that he unashamedly is asking. And you can go on to YouTube and put Jesse, do, oh, sorry, I said it. Um, you can put in his name, and you can watch him walk down the hallway of his office as he points to these huge glossy pictures of one corporate jet after another corporate jet after another corporate jet that he unabashedly um, brags about these things have been so great. So that is who? Jesse Duplantis, otherwise known as the Raging Cajun. So um, he is from Louisiana. How many of you know who Mr. White Teeth is? Anybody know who that is? Okay, you all know who that is. What's his name? John. John. You know, he just, I, I don't even want to mimic him. Um, <laughs> ooh. Yeah. You know, you know, and we hear things like, your best life now. That this is God, God wants you to have your best life now. Um, when Larry King asked him, is Jesus really the only way to heaven? And he goes, I, you know, I don't know. Um, are these things simple? I don't know. I don't know. You know, I'm just here to say Jesus loves you. Um, so a clear part of the gospel is that Jesus Christ shows us where we are wrong and where we are we are called to be right in him and in him alone. So um, key issues. How about the next one down here at the bottom? How many of you know who that is? You know who that is? That's Pat Robertson, 700 Club. Um, and we would call that soft prosperity gospel. He would, he would be what we would, he's not a hardcore soft prosperity gospel, but he would be a soft prosperity gospel. Um, There's still um, preaching and teaching um, very often proclaiming the gospel, and, and history has bore out that there is a massive machine behind that in which, in which he controls it and in which the gospel is compromised over and over again, um, exalting other issues. 
Now, the next one may be more obscure. I doubt hardly any of you know who this next one is. How many of you know who the next one is? Okay, almost nobody does. Um, his name is Robert Tilton, um, also very extreme in his prosperity gospel. And then Joyce Meyer. Um, there are many women preachers. This, hap this particular collage is only a few of them. There's many, many other ones. You know, Joyce, Joyce has written some incredibly um, perceptive and helpful things concerning suffering and especially for women in suffering of having women that um, maybe have abusive husbands or women that are dealing with drug addiction. She would have come out of that or sex addiction or some of those things. But here's part of the danger is that very perceptive things can be being um, written in that, but when you start to peel back and you start to see um, the, extre the extreme nature and very often coming to, uh, to proclaim that the prosperity gospel is really what God is. I mean, she brags about being a prosperity preacher. She, she very, very clearly brags about that, and she sees her success financially with her $11 million home as a, as a badge of honor of her faith and her prosperity. Um, and then what about the last one? Who, does anybody know who that guy is? Anybody know who that guy is? Okay, so if you, what's his name? Kenneth, Kenneth Copeland. He's another part of the jet set. Um, he has a couple of beautiful, nice, uh, in fact, a, a Grumman Gulfstream 4, which is quite an expensive jet. And, and so when we start to look, this is just a few actually, of the ones that are, so, so this is not a small thing. These, these are just the ones that are on television here. What, what we don't want to miss is that there are many of them that are right here in Broward County, not any faces that are here, but in small neighborhood churches that are teaching the same falsehoods at a very small local level. So this is not just about the people on television. Um, we could go into, even though that's what most of these are, there are many, many others um, that are here. So we, we want to be, we're not doing this to be mean. We're not doing this to be self-righteous. I want to be very clear about that. In fact, we said the first week or two, we are going to call out names and we're going to call out t various groups saying our argument is the gospel has to be pure. God calls us for the gospel to be pure. God calls us to be careful. I, I thought about this this afternoon. Um, I went in someone's house one time, and the TV was on, and it was on uh, one of these channels, TBN. And as we were sitting there talking in a little bit, and the TV's kind of blaring, the person made this comment. They said, well, it's Christian, and it's better than nothing. And I thought, that's not true. It would be better to have nothing than to have a false gospel being proclaimed and wrong ideas, ideas being sown into our heads. Um, a false gospel, and, and in fact, a, a program that is based about, around a false gospel um, potentially could be argued uh, is more dangerous than even a program that is based around maybe sin vices um, and various things like that. Um, because wrong teaching can come camouflaged in the idea and in the name of right teaching that subtly deceives us into something that is very, very false. And so we, we need to be careful in what we're watching. We need to be careful in what we're reading. We need to be careful in what we're pursuing as we come to the Word of God and seek to walk in the truth. You can take that picture down, guys. That, I know we're tired of that one. Um, so um, I just want to continue for us to raise the alarm of our awareness of that we want to keep coming back to Jesus Christ and Him crucified and, and not the, the issues of loving and falling in love with anything of this earthly world that would cause us to not look at Christ. 
And so um, I know some of you have a new set of notes tonight, which means that you don't have some of these blanks filled in that we buzz through here a little bit. Do the best you can with that a little bit. If you have your old notes, you'll be able to follow along. But look at page 85. We're going to very quickly look at this real quick, just so you can get the idea. Um, top of page 85, prosperity gospel. What is the prosperity gospel? You have page 85, right? Everybody has page 85? Um, and so we're kind of looking at that. It's the theology that asserts that God's aim is to make us believers, to make believers healthy and wealthy in this life. And to enjoy the excess, the excesses, the excesses, to to live like quote unquote the king's kids, um, and a, a, an important thing is going to be stated here in our study tonight that refutes this idea that we are to be the king's kids, enjoying all the things of this life in this best life now. Um, look at the bottom of page eighty-five. What does the prosperity gospel teach? And we looked at a few things. A distorted view of God and the Trinity, we added. A distorted view of God and the Trinity. A distorted view of man. Um, the fact that the idea is that man has supernatural power to manipulate the physical realm. This is kind of the ideas in telling people you speak at things in your life and you name things and you claim things and this, you know, th this is your power and if you have more faith, you have the power to manipulate things. Um, I remember as a kid, Bill Billingsley saying in this church, you guys need to be careful about running around talking to demons. I know we see that in the book of Acts, but you need to be, you need to be calling upon the Lord more than you need to be talking to demons. Um, and there's because there was a there, in the eighties there was a preoccupation with a lot of demonic activity and and recognizing the reality of it, but then becoming somewhat obsessed with it. There were books written, novels written that really got everybody kind of thinking about demonology. And let me just tell you that we're always safe focusing on Christology more than demonology. The more we focus on Christ, we are safer. And so, um, but, the, but part, of the part of the deception there was that, you know, that you have this spiritual power um, to go deal with those things and you're dealing with it and, and some would be projecting that and calling that faith um, as opposed to really looking and depending upon Christ. I'm not saying that there aren't things that we sometimes engage, and I've seen a few situations, been involved with a few situations where when something's very demonic, very obviously demonic, and, and we're, we're addressing that kind of thing. But by and large, we need to recognize that our greatest safety is exalting Christ, glorifying Christ, looking to Christ, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Um, that is where the real victory comes more than anything else. Um, the world revolves around man's wants. That's part of the distorted view of man. Um, the, the idea of very uh, man-centric gospel. That's part of the God wanting to make you healthy and wealthy. You know, that the gospel, people's world, they can grow up under prosperity thinking and kind of thinking that the kind of everything revolves around me. There's not a Christocentric view. What do I mean by Christocentric view? A Christ-centered view. We want to be very Christocentric in our church. We want to be Christocentric in our personal faith. We want to say, man, it just everything goes around Jesus. Everything depends upon Jesus. Not everything depends upon the congregation or everything depends upon us or everything depends upon the preachers or the elders or, or whatever. The, no, no, everything is exalting the one who paid for the church with his own blood. Notice the next part here, bottom of page 86, a distorted view of health and wealth. And so this promises financial success through faith. This promises physical health through faith. Top of age, page 87, um, we see a distorted understanding even of salvation. And these two phrases were important like two weeks ago when we looked at this. Does Jesus save us from sin and damnation in eternity? Or does Jesus save us from sickness and poverty on earth? What you will find in the prosperity gospel, there is some lip service to the top one, but the bulk of their time is spent on the second one. Do you see what I mean by that? Do you understand what I'm saying? Look at, look at what it says. Does Jesus save us from sin and damnation in eternity? That is the great rescue. 
The salvation from sin and rescue in eternity is the great rescue. The, the, sickness and poverty in this life is, I mean, that's a need, but that is not the greatest need. And, and we see this um, as a distorted uh, priority there. Distorted interpretations of Scripture. And here's a huge one. Middle of page 87, it says, The prosperity gospel rips texts, that means taking a text of the Bible, out of its context. Context is everything. You cannot understand the Bible apart from the rest of the Bible. You have to have the Scripture around it. You have to have the picture that's there. You can, here's another way to say it. You can make the Bible say anything. You can make the Bible. But when you take the whole of Scripture, when you take all of the Old Testament and you take all of the New Testament and you, and you weigh the text, any text that you're in, in light of the whole of Scripture, that's when you start to understand what it really says. So the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible. That is, that is the best um, picture of that. So keeping things in context and recognizing that those things in context. And, you know, the idea is, does prayer guarantee good health? Well, um, we see a lot of people who prayed and they didn't have good health. The Apostle Paul um, didn't have good health. Um, and uh, there, there's many times where we see the Apostle Paul is in beatings and struggles and, and strife and in danger and everything else. And we wouldn't say it was because he had no faith. Um, that, that was never leveled against him. Um, so several statements there about um, on page 88 and on page 89 um, about these things. Um, look at page 88. Does faith guarantee prosperity? Faith is patient in suffering. Faith is patient in suffering. Doesn't immediately think, oh, you're suffering. You got to be away from the suffering. No, faith is patient in suffering. We see this in the Bible, like a farmer, like a prophet, like Job, hoping in God's purpose. Um, faith is prayerful in sorrow. When you have, you know, here's an important thing. When we have sorrow, that is one of the greatest times for us to pray. It's not the time to stop praying. It's the time to start praying very often. When you're sad, when you're experiencing difficulty, when you're, when you're stressed. The, I, I wrote somebody the other, last night um, saying that, oh, wow, you're in, a lot of, you're in a lot of stress. There's a lot of trouble right now. I know that you're very frustrated. I just want to remind you that now's the time to pour it on in seeking the Lord. I said it's triple points right now. And I'm kidding by saying that in a little bit. What I mean, though, is you can learn a lot in the times of struggle in the times of trouble, when you press on. We studied it Sunday. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. In the hard times, when we seek Him, we just sung about it at the beginning of the service. Are you only God when there's blessing? Are you only, are you only God when, there's, when everything's sunshine? Oh no, you're God even in the days of rain. You're God even in the days of pain. And so this is, this is what is, God is glorified by our trusting him in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our suffering. So look at the bottom of page 88. Um, the gospel, the prosperity gospel, ignores clear counterexamples in the Bible. What do we mean by counterexamples? But you look at the teachings of Jesus. Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds have air in the and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I mean, Jesus is saying is, if you follow me, you're going to be poor, um, very likely. Um, we see numerous places where all of those things, if you love the things of the world, you cannot follow me. Um, rich young ruler comes to him and says, I want to be one of your disciples. And Jesus just looked at him and said, great, go sell everything you have and come follow me. Give it all to the poor, come follow me. And he went away. He didn't follow, he didn't follow after the Lord because he actually didn't really want to follow the Lord. Um, so in the middle of page 89, he says, it's, for them, for, for the prosperity gospel, it's, it's not so much the health and wealth gospel, uh, the, the real gospel is not so much the health and wealth gospel, it's more like the homeless and wounded gospel. Um, that's, that's more of what it's like. Um, and we see the life, not only the teachings of Paul, but the, uh, Jesus, but also teachings of Paul, uh, middle of page 89, or toward the bottom of page 89. And then on page 90, it's not, the, you know, the prosperity gospel, it's, it's more like the adversity gospel. I mean, we, you come to Jesus, things aren't going to necessarily get better. In fact, they may get worse. 
in this earthly sense. If you're Muslim and you live in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, or many other places in the Muslim world, but I happen to have friends in those three countries that when they came to Jesus, things really went worse. It got worse. They lost their businesses. They lost their family. Many of them lost their homes. Um, looking through pictures, getting ready for the missions banquet the other night, and I, I looked at a, a young lady um, named Fadila, and um, she became a Christian. Um, her husband became a Christian. Amazing. Well, they, they, had, they had both become Christians separately, and then they got married, and um, her family had kicked her out, and so and his family kicked him out, and they lived in a little tiny, not even a one-bedroom place. It was really just this a room, um, and they were kind of making it along, and she got pregnant, and they had a baby, and, you know, there they are in Algeria, and he would paint things. He would, he would paint buildings and paint various structures, and just one day he slipped, and he <coughs> fell onto a, a high-voltage power line and was killed. Um, and there we are with Fadila. She is a single mom, and her Christian husband has died. And I'm telling you, um, I, as a young missionary, I was just going, oh, wow, that's a lot to bear. I tell you, Fadila, she didn't miss a beat. She said, I... I trust the Lord in the good times and in the bad. He is my God. And you just, you look at that faith and God is blessed in that. And the missionaries are taught lessons by the people that they're going to go disciple. You know, there are many, many Christians around the world that can teach American Christians a lot about this issue of pain and suffering because we have this incipient prosperity gospel that's made its way in that when things go bad, sometimes we immediately doubt. Um, so um, we, we just want to see that this is real and really looking at the message of the Bible is very, very important for us. Um, I, I, we, we have to blast forward. There are 12 things of why this is dangerous. Everybody look at page... Um, Eight or 91, everybody look at page 91, and tonight we're going to, this is our main message, and we're going to blast through this and let you see this. Um, why the prosperity gospel is so dangerous? Why is the prosperity gospel so dangerous? Number one, it perverts, fill that in, it perverts, P-E-R-V-E-R-T-S, it perverts or distorts, you could also use the word distort, our understanding of wealth in this world. And so look at Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 7 through 9. Two things I ask of you, deny them not to me before I die. Remove me from, remove from me false and li- falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? So do you guys see what he's saying here? The, the wisdom words are, Man, don't make me rich, because if you make me rich, I may deny you. I may leave you. Look at this, and he says, or make me poor, the idea is here, lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of of my God. The, The proverb writer is simply saying, boy, wealth or lack of wealth should not be our guide. It is it is seeking to Um, view all of this in proper perspective. So is wealth always a sign of God's approval? Right out there to the side, no. Is wealth always a sign of God's approval? It's not always a sign of God's approval. Uh, Is wealth always a sign of God's disapproval? No. So, yeah, sorry. Is poverty um, always a sign of God's disapproval? And the answer to that is no. So you see a guy that's poor, you don't immediately think, oh, he has no faith. Or, oh, he's, he's been un, uh, unfaithful. There are many, many people who are exceedingly faithful, and they're quite poor. And yet, their faith may be great um, in this. Is it, is it true that all poor people have more faith than rich people? Absolutely not. That is not that is, you, you cannot make any of these statements. 
along these lines. Look at the next one. So it perverts, it can pervert, prosperity gospel can pervert our understanding of wealth. Number two, um, and you may want to put big number one, number two out there to the side of these bullet points. That may help a little bit. Number two, it disregards the purpose of wealth. So prosperity gospel can disregard why God has given us wealth. Um, So look at this question. Does God give us more so we can get more? No. But that is the world's message. You get more, and then you get more, and then you can, if you get more, then you can actually use that to get even more and get more. I heard Dr. Dobson one time on a radio program, probably when I was a freshman in college, he said, you know, the world's view is get all you can, can all you get, sit on the lid, and poison the rest. I mean, that's kind of the way the world looks at it. Get all you can, can all you can get, put it, put it under a lid, sit on the lid, and poison everything else. I mean, that's a really pagan view of, of wealth, but that's very often the way the world looks at wealth. We don't want to look at it that way. We're not given more to get more. Um, look at the next point that is there. Or does God give us more so that we can give more? And the answer to that is yes. Does God give us more so that we can give more? And that is, that is exactly the idea. And, and by the way, right out there to the side before you flip over the sheet, because this is what God does. You see, God gives and gives and gives and gives. In fact, our, we had a whole sermon series entitled, Our Giving God. And the idea is that God is a giving God. He's a generous God. Um, And we see that throughout the scripture. Look at number three on page 92. Prosperity gospel minimizes the dangers of wealth. It really doesn't talk about the dangers of wealth. Some of you are going, what are you talking about? What do you mean dangers of wealth? Why in the world, who would ever talk, I've never heard of dangers of wealth. How can wealth be dangerous? Well, it can be extremely dangerous. In fact, notice this, wealth is not just a blessing from the king that we so often talk about. It's also a barrier to the kingdom for many. The Lord Jesus himself said how difficult it is for the wealthy to enter the kingdom. Look at Mark chapter 10 and verse 23. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. You see, wealth makes us self-sufficient. Wealth, if we have a little bit of prosperity gospel ideas, we, we think, oh, well, I'm blessed. In fact, we often use that phraseology that, oh, this year I made a lot of money. It was a real blessing year. Or, you know, I had a relative die, and they left me all of this, and we've just been really blessed. Well, you know, if you talk to my father-in-law who deals with estates, he would say, actually, I've seen a lot more that are cursed by what they inherited than what they were blessed by. I've seen children who got along all their lives and then mom and dad died and they became enemies over the estate and sue each other and lose the testimony of their family, You lose the testimony of their Christianity because they just get so angry over those issues. Now, I know I'm talking to people right here in this room that some of you have dealt with this and some of you maybe even said, Probably, I don't know, I'm not sure I necessarily did the right thing. But this is the power of wealth to cause us to forget some of the main things that God wants us to remember. And to some of the main things that he wants us to see. The fact of the matter is, is that wealth can keep you out of heaven. I'd rather be poor and know God than have all the things of this world and not know God. Jesus himself said, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but lose his own soul? Did you hear that? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world, the whole world, and lose his own soul? Not even everything in this world could be compared 
to your soul being saved by the Creator um, in eternity. So notice these here. Um, fill this in as well. It feeds the desire to be rich with Scripture. Um, so it, th- very often we see this. It feeds the desire to be rich, um, w- excuse me, while Scripture warns us against the desire to be rich. So prosperity gospel will often cause you to want to be wealthy, um, to, to exalt being wealthy, when Scripture we see is not exalting that at all. Um, by the way, this is part of the problem with a lot of pyramid screen- schemes. I spoke with someone today who part of their testimony in coming to Christ was in fact even being involved with Amway. Um, and one of the problems with some of the pyramid screen- schemes that are out there they play on your desire to have more money and things. So we understand that there's, no, there's nothing wrong with desiring to make a good living. There's nothing wrong with desiring to be successful financially and even to some degree it being a challenge and enjoying that challenge of doing that and, and some of those things. And it's, it's a good thing to desire to save your money and be able to, um, to take care and be responsible among yourself. That those are all good, good things. There's nothing, we see those, th- in fact, some of those things exalted in the Bible under the issue of being responsible, under the issue of being um, willing to work, under the issue of being the type of person that is wise in savings. But once we cross the line over into looking at things and letting these things and the desire for these things to be the motivating force in our work and the motivating force of our life and our our identity starts to be caught up in those things, that's when we've crossed over to loving the things of the world and the desire to be rich. Look at 1 Timothy 6, um, 9 through 10 in the middle of page 92. Uh, In fact, I'm going to ask somebody to read that good and strong. David Moran, would you mind reading 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10, where it says, but those... man, it doesn't get any clearer than that. that the, this desire that is played upon by very often by prosperity gospel um, is exactly opposite to what we see in the New Testament. Um, look at the next one that is here. Number four, in the middle of page 92, and number four, it ignores the clear shift in Scripture from the Old Testament to the New Testament. And here's an important thing that I quite honestly hadn't thought a whole lot about, but this is, I I believe, really, really helpful. Um, Regarding the commands of God, notice the first bullet point there, the dark bullet point. It says Old Testament, circle Old Testament. Old Testament, abundance of promises of material reward for spiritual obedience. And we see that in Genesis 17, and we see that really kind of throughout a lot of the, the... the Old Testament, we see, man, when you are obedient to me and when you are, are, are listening to me and following me, I'm going to bless you and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to cause even your enemies to be at peace with you. I'm, we see a lot of that type of blessing in the Old Testament, a very overt, very obvious blessing to help, help um, as, as people are turning to God to come and to see, trusting God, that God is a giver of good things. So we, we see that. But look at the New Testament, at the bottom of that page, on page 92. In the New Testament, circle New Testament there, there's a lack of promises of material reward for spiritual blessing. And just tell me if this isn't true, but Greg, Craig Blomberg, a great theologian, um, it's on the top of page 93. Notice this, this quote that is here. He says, The New Testament carries forward the major principles of the Old Testament and inter, intratestamental Judaism with one conspicuous omission. Never was material wealth promised as a guaranteed reward for either spiritual obedience or simple hard work. Material reward for piety never reappears in Jesus' teaching. 
and is explicitly contradicted through, throughout. Jesus is saying, hey, if you're going to come to follow me, they're going to chase you down. In fact, look at what they did to me, and they're going to probably do worse to you. We see that at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So, and this is going to be the case regarding the place of their worship. We, we see this shift in the Old Testament to the New Testament. In the Old Testament, the temple as the building. The, the, you see the temple as the building. This is the picture um, that God is going to come dwell within a building. Start off in the tabernacle, and then they finally built what? Solomon's temple. And then they tear down the temple and they rebuild the temple. And then it gets torn down again and Herod comes back and builds it again. But, and in fact, even right now, there's all kinds of groups that are saying, we've got to rebuild the temple, even now. The problem is there's a mosque on top of it and there, there's several other things there that are very complicated. But, but we see this picture of Old Testament is the temple as the building. But in the New Testament, the temple of God is not the building, but the body. God comes to dwell within his people. He comes to dwell within his people both individually and collectively in the body of Christ. Or do you not know, look what it says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Do you not realize that? And so regarding, regarding the purpose of blessing in the Old Testament, here's part of the picture, in the Old Testament, that the nations might come and see God's glory. So in the Old Testament, God is moving with this chosen nation, and he, listen to this, he is telling all of the other nations, come and see what, come and look at my people. I am with my people, and I'm going to bless them, and they are going to be, to some degree, an envy among the nations. The other nations are going to come and look and they're going to see my relationship with them and they're going to see that I give good things to my children. So Old Testament, that is what we're seeing. If they're going to be obedient, the other nations are going to see their faith, see their trust in God, and they're going to see the blessings of God upon them. So the Old Testament view, excuse me, the Old Testament statement to the world was come and see. Now we see a different statement. In, in the New Testament, we see that God's people might go and tell. And so it wasn't telling the world, come and see us, but now Jesus is saying to us, go and tell. Go and tell who I am. Go and tell what I've done. So here's, here's part of the idea. Wealth is all about us going and telling. God has actually given us this wealth in order for us to be obedient to him to go and tell. Look what it says in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And uh, Tim, would you mind reading this? And just look at this and think about this. Jesus is leaving. Jesus is, is going to the Father. He's going to send the Holy Spirit. He is going back in his bodily form to heaven. And he gives us this final command to, to the age that we are in. Go ahead. No, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. So this whole picture is he's sending us out and he's giving us wealth to be able to go and take the message that it can go around the world. Now, um, I, I, number five is, is something that, that we need to be very aware of, that the prosperity gospel commends selfish luxury over selfless generosity. So it, it commends selfishness, selfish luxury, over selfless generosity. Part of the idea is this picture of in encouraging you to indulge your pleasures, encouraging you to have more. I mean, this is part of the reason that they would park a, a Rolls Royce in the foyer of the church. 
is part of the reason that they, they make movie sets or, or, or TV sets that just exude opulence. And the idea is, is that, you know, if you're one of the king's kids, that you should live in a, in a castle and a kingdom and, and all of these things. And the more faith you have, the more you're going to have of this world's things. And we just see that that is completely um, anti-scriptural. Um, look what it says in Mark, to, or the next point here is, it, expli- it explicitly encourages people in, to indulge in pleasures. Um, look at Mark 4, 18 through 19. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfaith- uh, un- unfruitful. So the part of the picture is, is that when, when we love the things of the world more than we love the gospel, um, then it chokes out the gospel in our life. It also implicitly, fill this in, implicitly leads people to ignore the poor. Um, so it, just not a lot of emphasis may be put on that. When we, when we look at the poor, that God is actually calling true Christians to be mindful of the poor and careful of the poor. Um, and to share with the poor, not to ignore them. Um, Galatians 2.10 says, Only they ask us to remember the poor in the very thing I was eager to do. So th- this is a calling of the church, to remember the poor. The poor in the church, or perhaps the poor outside the church as well, that we would be mindful of that. Number eight, or excuse me, number six, down there at the bottom of page 94. It appear, excuse me, it appeals, so the prosperity gospel appeals to the desires of the flesh instead of calling people to deny the flesh. So when you're sitting there saying, don't you want to have all these, don't you want to have this new house? Don't you, you know, the people, that, I mean, I've heard sermons preached in this county, um, here, very near to here, um, even churches that we have started that appeal to people's flesh saying, you know, you just, you just need to trust God for that new house. You need to trust God for that lack of financial pressure that he's going he's gonna to get rid of that old car and give you a newer car and that you can enjoy that and you can enjoy that destiny that he has for you in these things that you just need to, by faith in Jesus, claim those blessings. Well, I, I'm not sure by faith in Jesus we are to claim new houses. Um, we can say by faith in Jesus, Lord, give me a place to live and take care of me, please. That's a legitimate prayer. But it is not to be in love increasingly with the things of this world. Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse 23 through 24. Um, Stephen Cawthon, would you read that real loud from back there in the back? Luke 9, 23 through 24, at the bottom of page 94. You see, that's, a, that's just a very different message than this idea that God wants you to be healthy and wealthy and all of these things that are around you um, in this way. God, God is saying, I have much more than that for you. Look at number seven, top of page 95. It encourages people, the prosperity gospel encourages people to waste their lives on things that do not last. Um, I think about John Piper's book, Don't Waste Your Life. He's saying, don't waste your life. Look at eternity. Look at the things that really matter. Look at Matthew chapter 6 in verse 19 through um, 21. Um, Tommy Chipman, would you read that? And everybody pay attention as Chom- Tommy Chipman reads Matthew 6, 19 through 21. So why would we want to encourage people to treasure the things that are going to pass away? Jesus explicitly says, don't do that. 
doesn't, nothing wrong with having a nice house, nothing wrong with having a decent car, nothing wrong with having some of the things here, but if this is our treasure, we're wrong. You say, well, I won't make it my treasure, but I sure do want it. Well, hmm. you know, that's what we start thinking. You, 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 only you know where your heart is on this. And, and we, we have to deal with that. Look at number eight there, um, just below that. Prosperity gospel, it exalts God's gifts, things we receive from God, above God's glory, the treasure we have in God. Now, this is, this is a big issue, and this is getting down to one of the key issues here of where we're, we're starting to see that we want his blessings more than we, we treasure his glory. Um, this is part of what I was talking about Sunday morning. We see this in Hosea 2, where the nation of Israel, here they're, they're wanting to come before God, and they, they want his blessings, but they don't really want him. Ooh. Some of you have kids, and your kids have wanted your blessings, but they've not really wanted you sometimes. And that starts to happen, and boy, it's, it hurts your heart. Notice this, and look at what Jesus says. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And he's not talking about physical things so much as he is talking about the real need of the soul. Um, here number nine and this is a huge one this is a key you see prosperity gospel here's what it does it abuses god by making him a means to an end and you may want to put out there to the side on this one this is the heart of the problem the heart of the problem is that we're abusing god by making him a means to an end this is mean that we're saying god i want you to make me happy i want you to come this is the idea of come to god and get whatever come to god and get your house come to god and get your stuff come to god and get your happiness come to god and get these things as opposed to come to god and get god do you want god do you do you, do you exalt, see this is the true gospel the true gospel says come to god and get god come to worship to see god Come to worship to remember who he is. Come to worship to know who he is. Come to worship to exalt him. Not come to worship just to be blessed. You see, that, that, that's, this subtly starts playing into this thing that we call consumer-driven Christianity. That many people in our culture today, are that, you know, they come to church because, man, you know, the world is painful and there's all this stuff out there and they're, they're looking for they're looking either for relief or whatever, and, and that's okay. We can come to the gospel out of our need, but there's some who come and they, they start saying, well, I just want to feel better. I, I really don't want God. I've had people sit in, in our office or I've had people sit and talk to me and we start talking about what it means to come to God in faith and to look to him, to trust to him and exalt him. And they're going, I'm not really interested in all that. Um, it's, that's actually kind of been said in a roundabout way not quite that verbose but notice this instead of trusting god for our needs we use god for our wants instead of trusting god for our needs we use god for our wants look at philippians 4 10 through 13 i rejoiced in the lord greatly that now at length you were revived in your concern for me you were indeed concerned for me but you had no opportunity not that i'm speaking in being of being in need for i have learned in whatever situation um, i am to be content i know how to be brought low and i know how to abound in any and every circumstance i have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You see, that statement of I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me is the idea here is that I'm just, I'm learning to trust the Lord and let him be my all. Um, as opposed to my happiness being dependent upon my circumstances. He says in Philippians 4.19, a couple of verses later, he says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So there's nothing that, that he lacks to supply for your need. But very often, 
we trust in God for our needs and use him for, instead of trusting him for our needs, we use him for our wants. Instead of God-centered intercession, prayer becomes man-centered coercion. You know, making deals with God. Or thinking to ourselves, well, I'm really praying about this, I'm really praying about this, maybe I'll get this new job, maybe I'll get this new promotion, or maybe I'll get this new contract, or maybe I'll get this new thing, or maybe, you know, sales will go up, or maybe this will happen, or maybe the, the house will be worth that. But, you know, we, we're, we're thinking that we're, we're just subtly making deals with God that are playing to our flesh. Look at James 4.3. We studied this a couple of years ago when we studied the book of James. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You know, there's been times we, even here in the life of the church where there's things that I felt like, gee whiz, I really wish we had this, or I really wish we could do this, or I really, this was happening. And, and there's been times when this verse has come to my mind, and the Lord has said to me, Andrew, does Sharon Hills really need that? Or, you know, he certainly supplied us with abundance. There's no doubt about that. But there's been times when I've said, Lord, I just... We need, to be, we need to desire to be faithful to the gospel more than we need to desire for comfort or ease or things that are just nice all the time. And I'm not saying, you know, Bill Billingsley would say, look, when, when we are presenting who the gospel is to the world, the church should not look like a dump. The church should look like what our message is is important. We want people, when they drive by Sheridan Hills or when they come onto our campus, we want them to go, wow, these people are serious. What is it that they're serious about? Churches that, that don't exalt taking care, not, not exalt, but don't carefully take care of their property and don't carefully take care of what God has given them and don't maintain that, that's a poor testimony of the gospel. They ought to look at that and go, hmm, this is, this is, this is serious. And so, but, but there, even so, there's been times when I've thought about things and the Lord has like prompted me saying, just keep seeking me, I'm going to give you what you need. Amen? Look at the next part here. Number 10, bottom of page 95. The prosperity gospel, here's something else it does. It subtly infuses all of Christianity. Now this is, this is it. don't turn your page over yet. This is a sweeping statement. And I think, I think David Platt, as he's written this, I think he's correct in saying that all of Christianity deals with prosperity gospel thinking to some degree. And we need to be very careful about that. How do we know this? How do we know that we all struggle with this? Turn the page and notice this. You see, because it becomes evident in how little we give, and it becomes evident in how much we own. There may be a few places in the world that culturally, within their Christianity, that they are, that they really, really give sacrificially, but just about everywhere where I've been, I see that it's a struggle for Christians. You say, well, the guys in Algeria, do they really deal with that and everything? And I, and I, I would have to say to you, yeah. I mean, one of the great things that we were warned about as missionaries in impoverished places was, be very careful what you do with the money and the nationals. You give a guy a bicycle, and it can cause a church split over a bicycle or over a sound system or over a roof or you not saying you shouldn't give a bicycle not saying you shouldn't give a sound system but this idea of showing up with a lot of money and start throwing it around there there's it's a very dangerous thing and so that that can that can begin to show and and we start to see that even within the lives of the Christians in those places, even they can, at a much smaller level than we do, they can still be very concerned. Well, I've got to get this, and I've got to hold on to this. And they're, they're, they're not giving as much as they ought to give. I, I remember kind of thinking at a time when I was there that, man, these, these people have so little. Should we really challenge them to give when they, they're not, some of them are not even eating uh, three meals a day. How can you tell someone like that that they still need to give? But that is exactly what they need to do. They need to recognize even in their small amount 
that God has called them to be generous toward others. And that God is, in, in, and this is one of those places in Malachi where he says, you just come and see if entrusting me with what you have, if I cannot take care of your needs. And I will not bless your needs. That's not prosperity gospel. That is scriptural gospel. But it's not so that you can have all that you desire. It's all that you need. He says that in Malachi 3. He says, if I can pour open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing until there is what? No more need. It doesn't say until there is no more want. But he says no more need. Y'all are looking at me funny. I hope you're not being... This is important. Number three, or excuse me, number 11 page 96 up there toward the top page 96 number 11 prosperity gospel overlooks the design of suffering christians may suffer despite their righteousness you see god has a design in this christians may suffer despite their righteousness job 1 1 this is an amazing you know, job will fix you on this if you'll spend some time in job there was a man in the land of us whose name was job and that man, man was, underline it, was what? Blameless and upright. One who feared God and turned away from evil. <laughs> if you read the rest of that chapter, you go, wow. His suffering began. And it wasn't because he was sinful. In fact, you can clearly make a statement here. He actually suffered because he was righteous. I mean, God, God was saying, well, have you considered my servant, Job? I mean, God brought up Job's name. You see, this is where our faith is going to get tested. And we begin to look and we study and we see that God, God is going to work in this. Notice the next statement here. Christians may suffer because of their righteousness. In 2 Timothy, down there at the, in the middle, it says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted or will suffer hardship, is the idea. Look at John 15, 18 through 20. And here Jesus is speaking. He says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. Very similar to Matthew chapter 5 and 6. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world... But I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my word, they would also keep yours. So Jesus is simply saying, um, precisely because you are righteous in me, there may be suffering, there will be suffering that's what second timothy says it says it's a guarantee number 12 right here and this is the last one i want you to see this it fails to acknowledge prosperity gospel fails to acknowledge the necessity of suffering now this is something you will never hear in prosperity preaching this number 12 right here bottom of page 96 you're never going to hear this proclaimed by these people it fails to acknowledge the necessity of suffering now i want you to think about this for me with me for just a moment what would happen if jesus said oh suffering mm -mm, not going to do anything that involves suffering where would we be we would be in our sin we would have the wrath of God upon us. We would have the judgment poured out on us if we took the attitude that no suffering was ever part of God's plan. But here we see, whoa, that because of the suffering, God is exalting Christ Jesus. And he has called us to this. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 25. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and the servant, his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they malign those who are in his household? Jesus is saying this. Look at Acts 14, 22. Strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that 
through many tribulations, underline it, we must enter the kingdom of God. There are going to be many tribulations by which Christians will enter the kingdom of God on the path of faith. Look at Romans 8, 16 through 18. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs and heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided, circle that word, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed in us. So this, this is part of our faith. This is part of exalting Jesus as the Messiah is that we will suffer. Part of believing in him is suffering with him. That's an important concept. Part of believing with him is suffering him. We're not saved because of that, but we are seeing that this is part of what it means to look at him and to trust in him. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4, 12 through 14. And this, is, this just goes... Um, all the way through. Look at what it says. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial. Circle those words. The fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange was happening to you. But rejoice in so much as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for this name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now friends, I just, I want us to recognize that this can bring so much comfort to us in a fallen world where there's suffering. You know, I would hate to go through all the suffering and think, oh, I must not have a must enough faith that's why i'm having all this, these health problems or that's why i'm having all these financial problems is i just don't have enough faith i would hate to to think that that's the end of of my that's the result of all my suffering and i would also hate to think this that that there's no real reason for this but when we begin to see what god has designed that we would look to him in spite of the troubles that we would exalt him in the midst of our pain that we would trust him in the midst of our hardship whether it be by by poverty or whether it be by even physical adversity that we would say lord i still look to you because without faith it's impossible to please god but with faith all things are possible and he is exalted. So friends, may we recognize that the true gospel just clearly says, hey, there's going to be suffering. Look to the Lord in the midst of it. Look to the Lord in the midst of it. I think it would be good for us to pray tonight that God would help us to have a good theology of the suffering, that we would, that we would have faith in the midst of our suffering, that when we have the disappointments or the hardships or the losses, the losses that can be so huge, that we would see that if we gain Christ, that we truly have all that we need in him. Let's pray.